to ask you to join me in prayer. We thank you, God, this morning for inviting us to walk with you again into a new neighborhood. Allow us to be open to what we may find there. That as we walk, we will realize that even when we're not well received, you still are with us. We still have something to say. We still have something to share. You're still calling us to go. So speak to us this morning. And thank you again. In Christ's name we all pray. Amen. I just want to take a moment to thank Virginia for doing all this work with the children and uh, certainly having a teacher, a real teacher, teaching the kids the children's message. It's been a great experience. So thank you. Where's Virginia? Is she gone? Yeah. I know. She's embarrassed, but I, I just had to say it. So here's one of the first lessons that... Um, that I think all of us learn as a little kid. Um, not, everyone, not everyone wants to be your friend. I mean, that's just a reality of life. Not everyone wants to be your friend. Um, I remember so clearly, so clearly, when I switched schools in sixth grade. Um, I went to a school um, from first to fifth grade. And again, you have to remember, this is in Mexico where if you, are, if you can, you go to a private school because public schools are not in the best shape. And so I went to a school from first to fifth grade, but this school did not have middle school. So in order to make that transition without having to, to go through a test, my parents decided that it was a good idea for us to switch as I was beginning to go, as I was gonna go into sixth grade so that I can then have an automatic entrance to middle school there. Does that make sense? Okay. So my entire five years of education, I had spent them with the same, in the same school, with the same group of friends, uh, in the same space. Uh, so it, it, was, it was a big change for me. And um, I, I can tell you that it was, the, it was the right decision for us to move to that school. However, when, when that change happened, um, it was really hard. It was really hard to go to a new school it was really hard to be the new kid on the block. It was really hard to try to make new friends. Um, because a couple of things happened. Obviously, my classmates didn't know me. They knew each other because they had spent a long time together. Um, I didn't know them. And uh, as much as I was an outgoing kid, you know, it takes some time to, to, to feel comfortable with other kids. And some of them, just to simply put it, um, they just didn't like me, you know? Bel go figure. Um, certainly, my experience was far from, for those of you who saw the movie Mean Girls, it was far from that, yet it still felt really hard to be accepted and liked. And yet, as I think about it, many years later as an adult, I find myself sometimes in certain circumstances where I know that no matter what I do or don't do, some people, simply put it, will never like me. I mean, that's a reality of life. I think that many of you can relate to that. No matter what you do or don't do, some people will not like the way you dress, they won't like the way you work. They will not like the way you get your hair ready or when you don't have hair. Some people don't like your jokes, your voice, your personality. I mean, the list can go on and on. And again, no matter what you do or don't do, they simply will never like you. And that's fine. I don't think we are called to be liked by everybody. That's a different probably conversation. Yet the point that I'm trying to make here is that one of the first lessons that Jesus had to learn as he began his ministry was the reality that not all people was going to like what he had to say or what he was doing. As simple as that. Now, to be fair, to be fair, as we are visiting today the, 
uh, the neighborhood of Nazareth. I guess it is even harder when you realize that the people that you grew up with are the ones who don't like you. And that's exactly what is happening this morning. As Jesus is beginning his ministry and is, he is visiting his own people. So let us, let us start from the beginning. How did things change for Jesus? Well, everything changed the moment he finished his first sermon in front of his hometown. After Jesus spent 40 days in the desert and had a, what you would say a successful evangelistic campaign filled with miracles and signs in Galilee and the city of Capernaum, Jesus finally comes back to preach, as some would call, to his homies. He comes back home to preach his first sermon. And as you look at the beginning of his sermon, probably two-thirds of the, of the sermon through, you will see that everything starts really great. The Gospel of Luke is very intentional in letting us know how Jesus, as he's beginning his ministry, is very affirming of the Jewish traditions and faith. He, Luke makes this point by telling us that Jesus um, goes to the synagogue, you know, it's part of his faith uh, um, practice. He goes constantly to the synagogues. And it also let us know that Jesus is a good Jew as he is honoring the Sabbath. He's doing all of those things. Then as he is in the synagogue, he is reading the scrolls, which contained the beautiful words of the prophet Isaiah. Now again, indirectly, Luke is letting us know that Jesus is affirming uh, his commitment to honor uh, the prophets and, and God's law. So there's all this thing going on just to let us know that Jesus understands what it means to be a person of faith. Everything is going beautifully. His neighborhood and his friends cannot get enough of Jesus' eloquence. Um, some have their mouths open as they're listening to him. Other, others are so enthralled with what he's saying that they are beginning to text their friends to let them know what they are missing. Others couldn't simply stay quiet to what, what they were experiencing in that sermon. Everyone who was there watching and listening, according to Luke, was surprised. And they also even began to say among each other, isn't this Joseph's son? The one that we known since he was a youngster. Where did this come from? I didn't know he was that good. Now, basically, at this point, people are just waiting for Jesus to be done so that they can give him a standing ovation for the amazing and beautiful sermon that he's preaching. I mean, he's talking about if they're really listening to what I say is promising. He's, Jesus is telling them, you will get freedom from the Romans, liberation from, their, from economic change, freedom from debt. God's age has finally arrived. God is here with us, and God is going to take us to a new level. But then, right about verse 23, the sermon begins to go south for Jesus, for Jesus and his friends. The admiration that people had for Jesus quickly turns into disbelief. The excitement quickly turns into anger. When he makes it clear that the promises and the words of the prophet Isaiah are not just for the people of Israel, but for all, for all and to all in need. In fact, Jesus double downs here and goes as far as to say, that the miracles and signs that he did in Capernaum will not take place in his hometown, in his neighborhood, because of the resentment that God's love can be shared with the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Jesus, you know, here's the thing about Jesus. He's not subtle. When Jesus wants to say something, he will simply say it. Because as he's beginning to open this unfortunate uh, moment in his sermon, I would say, um, he tells two, two, two stories. He, he brings up two very well-known stories to the people of Israel. He talks about the prophet Elijah and how he was 
he helped this foreign widow. And then he talks about the other prophet, Elisha, and how when Naaman, the Syrian general, was covered with leper, he was the one who received the miracle, and not the people of Israel. Both stories are told by Jesus to illustrate one of the most important messages that you will find in the Gospel of Luke. All outsiders, even the foreigners, are welcomed into God's neighborhood. These strong words to the people of Nazareth do not come as a coincidence, nor are said by Jesus in a vacuum. You see, here's what's happening. Capernaum, according to biblical scholars, is said to have had a heavy non-Jewish population. So you can imagine what the people were saying and expecting from Jesus, the miracle worker. If Jesus helped and cured all those foreigners, I at least expect the same from him. If Jesus wasted his time with those people, the least I expect is that he will do the same for me. I'm going to be very disappointed if Jesus doesn't take care of his own. Jesus' words touched a very sensitive nerve among his people. So much, so much, that they thought that the best course of action was to kill him. That's how angry people got. The idea that God opened up and extended God's neighborhood to all, it was and still is very hard to accept. In Nazareth, Jesus shared a clear vision of what God's neighborhood looks like. And it included all of us, not just a certain group of people, but all of us. Because in other words, for Jesus, there is no neighborhood that is off limits. The rest of the Gospel of Luke will show Jesus healing the broken and welcoming even those most crushed and downtrodden people, tax collectors, hemorrhaging women, prostitutes, the beggars and the homeless. The invisible in the Gospel of Luke become visible. He forgives them, frees them, welcomes them, and changes them. He has been annoyed and sent to bring freedom from sin, not just to the people of Israel, but to all. Jesus has been anointed by God to create a new community that breaks down the barriers between insider and outsider, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor. In him, all flesh, literally all flesh, can see God's salvation. In his commentary about this passage, the John Wesley Study Bible, maybe some of you may have it, the John Wesley Study Bible says, Jesus' hearers do not want to share their privileges with outsiders, but his message is intentionally focused upon the marginal members of society, the poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. As part of our heritage, John Wesley began a deliberate program of visiting prisons, the sick and the poor, in 1730 at age 26. Because our United Methodist tradition is one that has always been determined to bring the word and love of God to where people were. They may receive it with joy or anger, may be found in a place of holiness over the probity, may be welcoming or hateful, but either way, we United Methodists go we go, we go. So here it is what Jesus' visit to Nazareth's neighborhood is teaching us today. There is no neighborhood, no people that are off limits for Jesus. In Jesus' neighborhood, all are invited 
There are no bad parts of town. In Jesus' neighborhood, those who are rejected are welcomed. And even those who like to reject can find a seat at the table. Recently deceased uh, biblical scholar John Craddock uh, concludes his commentary on this passage with the following. Jesus does not go elsewhere because he is rejected. He is rejected because he goes elsewhere. As we're looking at this conversation about who we are and we wanting to walk into our neighborhood following Jesus, may we find the courage to follow Jesus into all the neighborhoods with his love and grace, with his unlimited love and forgiveness, so that no neighborhood, no people can be off limits for all of us. Amen.